Hello and welcome to the Leadership and Insurance Podcast. I'm your host, Gavin Savage, and on this special edition of the show, we are joined by a very special guest who some many of the listeners should know. Uh, Alex Bond, welcome to your show. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Gavin. I can't tell you how weird that was to uh, hear you say that. I, I wanted to jump in and say, hang on, that's the wrong name. But um, yeah. <laughs> Well, thanks for having me on my show. <laughs> really appreciate it. <laughs> well, um, before we get into um, many of the topics we discuss, I think um, for those that may not know, um, could you kindly introduce yourself, um, who you are, the business you work for, and uh, and why we should listen to you today? <laughs> I know that's you getting revenge for seeing me do that to a few people on a panel once. Um <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so my name's Alex Bond. I'm founder and managing partner of FinPro Search Partners, um, mostly known as FinPro. FinPro is the executive recruitment brand for the insure tech industry. Um, as far as I know it, and we've never been corrected on this, we're the only insure tech specific uh, recruitment business in the world, um, which is quite an unusual thing. Um, why should you listen to me? Well, that's probably related to above. Um, uh, I used to work for a carrier. I've been in the insurance industry as a search and talent consultant now for 17 years. Um, and I've been running FinPro in its current guise for uh, the last four. Um, and we only do insure tech. Um, so if you don't listen to me about anything else, that's absolutely fine. But if we're talking about insure tech and insure tech talent, then I'd like to think um, I'm well positioned to help you out. Awesome. Awesome. And um, I guess as a very rudimentary first question, you know, could you, could you define um what insure tech means to you and um as a business being finpro why is it important to be insure tech specific for you um yeah that is a good question it's actually a question that gets asked it gets asked a lot by venture actually we have this conversation when we're talking to vcs quite a lot about you know what how do we define insure tech and yeah to a certain extent i think it's i don't know if it's that helpful a term um I think you know firstly insuretech likes to sort of believe the current guys of insuretech likes to believe that it's only been around in the last kind of like six or seven years but then you've had technology businesses serving the insurance industry for a long time um and some of those businesses are very large and very successful and they'd probably be quite annoyed about the idea that it's insuretech but I think how we define it today is is, is a, it's a spectrum so insuretech is a because a lazy term really to cover a bit of a coverable and for us, that's everything from like digital insurers, the likes of kind of Lemonade and Get Safe, through to kind of digital MGAs, digital brokers, um, and everyone that's sort of essentially revolutionizing the traditional distribution models and the traditional insurance incumbents, all the way through to kind of like SaaS businesses um, in the insured tech space. So those are businesses that typically serve the traditional insurance space, and those are either kind of like, you know, underwriting workbenches or, or analytics tools. Um, that helped to you know drive innovation and profitability with the insurance industry, and then we kind of move a little bit further on on that to things that are insure tech adjacent, where there is a very large insurance element, um, not necessarily their only vertical. And you know, uh, I'm thinking of this as like Climate X, uh, for example. That yeah, insurance is a big vertical for them, but it's not the only one. Um, so that's how we loosely define insure tech. Um, why is it important? I, I think the key thing when you're coming to any recruitment business or any talent business is how much does that business understand what you're looking for? How much does that business have a really strong network? And how quickly and efficiently can they access that network? So I started out my career in insurance claims. And for a large part of my career in the recruitment industry, I just did insurance claims. I, I did that for about six years. And you get to the point where you come out of a briefing with a client and you probably know the top four names on, of, on your list. You can't do that if you say, right, I am going to be covering fintech. Um, you can't do that even if you say insurance. Um, so it's important to kind of, really focus and i think why it's important in insure tech and insure tech as we say is still very very broad um there's something different about insure tech which probably doesn't happen in more 
established industries in that you most of our clients are venture backed most of sort of anything from series c through to series b you know maybe beyond as we sort of are hitting a more maturation um they need that kind of startup scale up mentality and our job is to find not just the rudimentary skill sets like you might need a broker you might need an actuary you might need a vp of engineering you might need a product person but it's also to get the person that's going to fit with inside the kind of stage and scaling speed that you're at and i think that's where we really really add value and i think that's why that's important um yeah nice and you i think you probably answered that to some degree because for, for those that maybe don't know alex and i work together on the recruitment side and i lead up all things tech but um you know when i joined it was it was all all geared towards insured sex, but yes, we focus on the insurance industry. But I think, as I say, you've probably answered it a little bit, and that why is it important? But why why don't we, or why 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 do we not now work with large insurers and and brokers? Because, well, I mean, there's there's more hiring to be done there. Surely they, mm -hmm. they have more money to spend. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, it's a question I battle with. I think, as you know, um. I think that's that's a little bit reflective of us, right? I, I think I like to be close close to the beating heart of the business. And the beating heart of a business is that founding team, it's that leadership team. In the same way that when people want roles, one of the appeals of working for an insurtech or a startup or a scale-up is that you're probably closer to the decision-making. Things happen faster. Um and for us, as a, as a relatively small business, like we need to work closely um, with the client. And there's two reasons for that. One, honestly, it's just a, it's a personal preference. I, I think that's just more enjoyable. You know, I, I genuinely feel like in a partner to the business, you know, because we're a function that exists in every business. If you're a big enough business, you probably have a talent team, a recruitment team. It doesn't mean you won't work with external providers, but essentially you've got someone managing that kind of workflow. Um we're really providing that for um, those smaller businesses. So, you know, from a kind of just personal um, enjoyment perspective, kind of fulfillment in my role, I want to work more closely with them. But the second side of it is is that is is related is that bigger businesses you have these layers. So you have procurement teams and you have recruitment teams and talent teams, and that's great and if, and the best ones are kind of really collaborative and 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 you know this you've been doing this a long time is that the best of those are really really good and, and you 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 still feel like a partner but quite often in the bigger businesses there's a huge cavern between you and actually the end client and that is the person that is making that hiring decision and that just makes my life so difficult um and difficulty we don't mind but I'm judged on my ability to deliver on a remit. And if I can't get close enough to my hiring manager, and I don't mean one sit down hour meeting where we have a briefing call and that's it, never to be seen again and then work with a group team. I need a constant back and forth. I need unfiltered feedback because being truthful, I probably have more experience than the person I'm passing the information through. And I want that unfiltered information. You know, what's good, what's bad about that candidate that you've interviewed? What am I missing that's not allowing us to deliver? And as and, and the more barriers you get there, the 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 harder that is. Um, and and you know, I've told this story a few times. The other thing is that that I didn't find a lot of what was being done there very interesting. You know, once you've placed the head of claims of a lawyer <laughs> syndicate. You've placed the head of games at the Lloyd Syndicate. You know, once you've placed the head of offshore energy, which is always the one I talk about, because I ended up doing four searches in the same year for the same class of business. You know everyone in that sector. Now it's good money, but we know, and, and the insure tech industry says that itself. You know, it's not all about the money. If it was all about the money, why aren't people staying in insurance businesses and income of businesses and just and just riding that out? Because there's there's incredible careers to be had there and, and great money to be earned. But I think it's the it's the challenge as much as anything. Um, yeah, I think I could go on forever about that because I because I, mm -hmm. I think it does come back to that thing. You know, I am I am an entrepreneur. This is a business I started, and most of it was 
because I wanted something more from those relationships. And, and, I, and I think you have to accept that when you're building with larger organizations, you're not going to get that. Um, mm. The only thing I'd extrapolate out of that is that that is starting to shift, as you know. Um, we are starting to see really innovative businesses building, not just innovation functions, but even like whole standalone businesses that run parallel. Now, those businesses are exciting. But as with all innovation teams, that only works if they have the autonomy and that means autonomy to choose a supplier such as us. And that means autonomy to make those decisions such as kind of working with, like with us um, really closely. And in those businesses, we are starting to work. So I think that will start to shift and change as we go on. Because, mm. yeah, we are seeing a lot more investment on the on the technology front. Um, certainly mm-hmm. I am and, 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 and you yourself. But, um, you know, you highlighted the the challenges, the inherent challenges of working with uh, with large organizations like what? For you, or because it sounds like the the early stage startup world is is easy to work with, and you and I both know it's it's not easy, but it's just more. No. There's more value adds. We can have deeper relationships. But what are the unique challenges for you of working with early stage businesses? Yeah, yeah, because I did paint a picture there that made it sound like it was all <laughs> all roses and we're all slipping along, holding hands, um, and we're definitely not. Um, I think early stage businesses, it, it's almost flipping flipping the conversation upside down for everything that's frustrating about the rigor and structure of a really established, you know, incumbent carrier, for example. You some, you don't have that quite often within um, a startup business. Now, startup businesses are not the same. They're, they're a they're as unique as a fingerprint um, and they're essentially the multiple fingerprints of the people involved. And, you know, some of these people are very kind of experienced business people, but they may, they might be quite inexperienced entrepreneurs. They also might be actually just inexperienced business people as well, which is particularly true of venture back businesses where maybe they come from another industry and they joined insurance. So I think that the, the challenge is usually one of education. That's the biggest gap. And that could be education around process. Um, what is an acceptable process? I mean, you have this in your world all the time. I see this quite a lot is that, you know, six stages is not acceptable because you're asking for too much of someone's time. How do we make that shorter but still effective? You know, um, compensation is is the bugbear of everyone. Um, yes, we're really passionate about your startup and you're really passionate about your startup and yes you've got equity but people have bills to pay so you can't fight the market if if a certain job profile or personal profile with certain job skill sets pays x in the market you can't do x minus 25 percent and if you do you have to accept that you're you're targeting a very small kind of range of people so i think education around like Things like process, education around the recruiting, um, the natural kind of flow of recruiting. Um, and then just the sort of quite often a sort of expectation management is much, much harder. Um, you know, working with a big incumbent, they'll go, yeah, I know this is going to take a long time. I know you're not going to be able to work miracles. Sometimes they even go, I know the compensation isn't where I need to go and I know what that means. Mm-hmm. Whereas... You know, there's such passion from venture back businesses. Sometimes it is like it's a list of demands that we know on the outset it's going to be very, very difficult to hit. Um, and so that expectation management is difficult, uh, particularly in terms of kind of numbers, because something risky, you know, we talk about risk curves all the time. I'm quite unique and I think about this all the time and it wasn't the way life was planned to be. But I'm a single guy and I'm 42 years old and I don't have any children. So I can take inherent risk. Like it doesn't matter to me that, that that I work for a business that may go under. But if you're got two kids in college and you know you're an insurance executive in the in the peak of your career, you probably can't join some seed round startup for fifty percent of your salary. So you've sort of got this bell shaped curve that people could take risk early in their career and, and people could take risk at the later end. And actually, quite often, what we're looking for is the people in that middle in the peak of their career. So it's it's managing all of those kind of expectations um, and enthusiasm into something that is achievable. That that is almost without doubt the biggest challenge. Mm. Super interesting. And the um, 
yeah, for anyone that's hiring in technology, as Alex said, six stages, uh, three tech tests with 100% pass rate is not <laughs> is not okay. <laughs> I think uh, I think that test thing's really interesting as well. In the in the yeah. it's so binary, and I, and I kind of get it. You know, like especially in tech, you can either code the thing or you can't code the thing. But you know, we live in a world where tests are 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 a fraction of time in someone's career you know and i'm not suggesting that for any one i would not bend the bar on quality in my team as you know like i'm really strict about that um that's why we're not as big as we potentially should be but um we talked about this last night you and i both looked at an ai driven recruiting tool mm -hmm. and one of the things that i thought about was it's amazing but there's a lot of kind of automatic discounting of, of X, Y, Z people for different reasons that you and I know some of the magic is around the edges. You know, those people that get 92% on the tech test and you should be 100, but their their values of the business in terms of kind of like the team, for example, that person that's like a absolute cheerleader for enthusiasm, like, you know, whereas you get the person's 100%, but they're actually quite toxic in the team environment. There's so much to it that... Any binary method, um, I think, is sometimes you've got to say, what is our variance here? Um, and it happens more in tech than others. But I'm seeing it now. I, I'm working with quite a few businesses in, in the Bay Area. And it's got that Silicon Valley kind of mentality where people are giving like um, personality uh, questionnaires. And they're mm -hmm. making it a binary yes or no. And I'm like, yeah. then all you're creating is group thing. But again, it comes back to that thing. It's an immature application of a tool that helps in recruitment without a kind of wide view context so yeah i mean that's where that's where we come in but yeah six stages three tech tests which that needs to <laughs> that needs to go in the bin of 2023 and 2024 it needs to not have that yeah it's certainly out for me i mean we see it we, don't, we see it less and less but um but yeah you've got to test the technical skills but i think attitudes uh activity and, and a willingness to learn should you know if someone comes in at 92 93 percent um you know i'm a believer in, in, in putting that person uh, progressing that but you know you've you kind of highlight you've highlighted for the past 10 minutes the i guess the relationships that we have with um with founders and and startups and, and generally the, the startup community particularly within insure tech given all these businesses are of course venture backed you know uh, I think it'd be a great to get an insight into, you know, defining your relationship and, and maybe the FinPro business's relationship with the VC community and the, the investors and, and why that's so important for us to be closely linked with them. So I wish I could be really clever and and, and remember a, a paper that someone wrote about venture back businesses, but essentially... Um, and someone quoted it on, on my own podcast, which I've now forgotten. I can't remember who said it or whatever. But I think the reason we we build such a close relationship with VC, and, and, and it's not something we actually sought out proactively to start with. Um, I was quite naive into venture-backed businesses because I'd always worked with pretty large insurers or brokers. And mm. yes, there were some independent brokers, but they were usually pretty large businesses. Um but a lot of the businesses were like publicly traded companies um, and it's a very different um, funding environment. Um, but when you're looking at venture back businesses, when you're looking at a kind of startup scale up world, there's two things you need to build a business and you need fuel, which is, which is, 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 is your uh, money. Um, and you need people. I think I'm sure it's fuel and fire, but I'm I'm horribly I'm sure I'm horribly wrong with that. But I know it's I know yeah, you know what it's gonna be fuel it's gonna be fuel and oxygen or something like that. It's about making fire. But yeah, anyway, essentially you need people and money. You need people and money, and and you need yeah. talented people, and and you need enough cash. So it's a very close relationship, and because we've proven, and I always say not to pitch on this, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go into it. It's just like we have a hundred percent success rate. There is not a single search that we've taken on we've not delivered on. And we do that in this environment. So if you're a venture business, a fund, and you're investing in a company and they need these really important hires to get them going, 
you want to have a close relationship with a recruitment business that can deliver on that. Look, there's loads of excellent recruitment businesses out there. Like we're not unique in having that sort of high hit rate. Um, we can get onto why you should retain people versus not in a, in a bit if it comes up. But like having a good relationship with people that can help your investment is part of what being a VC is all about. You know, I, I very much came into my relationships with VC. Hey, are they just write checks? And, and and I know so many venture uh, people now and, and, and they wish they only wrote checks, you know, but, well, they probably don't, but, you know, they wish it was as easy as that. But mm. it is about helping them with distribution. It's like sometimes helping them get like carrier partners. It's uh, if they're, if they're sort of happy with, trying to build an MGM model, for example. It's introducing them to people that are in their network that might join the business. It's introducing them to advisors. It's giving advice. It's being a sounding board. Um, and sometimes that's introducing them to people that can provide you with talent. So that relationship is really collegiate. It, it's very much like we're all on the same team um, because they want their investment to grow and get their returns. We want their businesses to grow because they'll need to hire more people and that it's so it's a really symbiotic relationship um at least that's the way i see it i i hope they see it the same way but um they 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 seem to invite us to enough um soirees and parties so uh, I, i'd like to i'd like to think that they do but um yeah it's not what i thought at the outset um but i think what's interesting and what's sometimes misunderstood is that you know vcs only can give advice once they write that check it's the entrepreneur that runs that business is still making those decisions. It's not private equity. They can't dictate. So, you know, it has to be a collegiate thing. You have to be in constant communication um, because you have to be the right fit for their investment as well. And sometimes we're not, you know, we, we had a business recently, we've done all of their hiring um, and they had a very specific hire that they needed. We weren't the right pick. So we we stayed on the bench for that one. And someone else was introduced by VC. And firstly, I got my nose out of joint about it. And then I thought, do you know what? They're giving the right advice there. So yeah, it's really collaborative. Uh, and it and it's a real, it's a real um their relationships I really cherish. Um, because it's it, they're some of the most kind of respectful partnership sounding board, interesting conversations that I have with the VC community. Mm. Just at the end, there you kind of mentioned around VCs being misunderstood, like kind of flipping that on you and us as as recruiters. You know, talking about one hundred percent success rate, and you mentioned again previously the the AI tool we we're discussing last night. Thank mm. God you never said the name of the company. We're not don't want to release that too soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We they still need us. But what's what do you think the biggest misunderstanding is about what we do in recruitment or what you do? um i've thought about this so many times um yeah i think there's two sides to this so there's 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 clients or potential clients and then there's there's candidates um the candidate one's easier because everyone gets this as soon as you say i work in recruitment it doesn't matter what sector someone works in if you're at a party someone sends you their cd and you know they might be a <laughs> a chef in high-end restaurants and you're like sorry i can't help you but even within your sector yeah there's only so much particularly for a firm like ours that specializes in kind of retained mandates there's only so much we can do to help because yes we've got a good network but our clients respect us because we don't just send them cvs that's not what we do we don't we don't just fish up loads of cvs and resumes and profiles and then just spam them out to people that is what a lot of people do. That's not what good firms do. So we're probably not the best route for you to sort of find a new role if you're proactively doing it or if you're or, or if you're made redundant. Now, that's not to say we we can't, and we really do, but you have to have that very niche specialist skill set and you have to be, you know, top end, top 10% talent. And that is not. That's a really hard thing to one quantify, but it's also a really hard thing to kind of say because mm. it sounds like, oh, we're not interested in trying to help you. But there's a misunderstanding there of what what our job is. Our job is to find the square peg for the square hole that our client has asked us to find. It is not to then suggest a triangle shaped peg for a hole that doesn't exist, you know. Um terrible analogy but you know i hope the kind of point remains so 
I think sometimes there's a misunderstanding there because I think people I'm disappointed and think, well, they weren't that helpful. I'll always help someone review a resume. I'll always give someone advice. And I'll always, if I've got really close contact, there's nothing to me to pick up the phone and go, look, if you were hiring, is there anything coming up on your slate that, that would fit someone like this? But there's a lot of caveats to that because I am what I represent. And if my clients are asking for that, essentially, I'm just sending them kind of, um, I'm just piling their desk with resumes that they 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 don't need and, and actually forcing them into a bit of a quandary sometimes. So I think that's the biggest misunderstanding from a candidate perspective. Um, and I hate talking candidates, clients, but you know, everyone's people, I get that. But let's just for the sake of this conversation. From a client perspective, we were just really unfortunate, right? We work in an industry which has a lot of bad actors, like a load of bad actors. Um and I particularly think this about I, I think the biggest misunderstanding is, is about kind of uh, retained work versus non-retained work, really. Or why you should, you know, put your your eggs in one recruitment basket. So pick one firm to work with exclusively. Um there seems to be, and I've heard this phrase like a lot more. It, it's, this comes a lot more from kind of um, uh, relatively new um, business owners, business starters, entrepreneurs. Is that why would I put makers in one basket where I can cover more ground by going with multiple um, recruitment providers? Well, firstly, we won't work with you. So there's like, you know, and that's that doesn't mean that you're not going to fill your mandate. It's just that, no, that's that's just the way we work. And, you know, unfortunately, then we probably won't work with you. Um, but if you're genuinely working with a specialist and it's very easy to find out, ask them who their last clients are, ask them for references and ask them what sort of roles they fill and ask them to evidence that. I don't know why people don't do that. It's what you would do if you were hiring someone and effectively you're outsourcing to us. Well, why wouldn't you ask us for references, roles we filled? and kind of our client list. And, and we would happily provide that for you. Like, so once you've got past that, if I'm genuinely a specialist, what ground do you think multiple people are gonna cover? And if you pay for our time, we will do that for you. And I think that's the other thing. That it, it's what we're doing. We No one has a magic wand. Everyone's got databases, but they're only so unique. Everyone has a network, but if that person is in that sector, specialised in the sector, it's really as good as their tenure in that sector. So yes, mine's good, but it's going to be better than someone that's been doing it two years. But really, you're paying for time. But could you do this yourself? Probably. If I gave you the tools that we have, you could probably do this yourself, but it takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And so you are paying for the time. So when we say, oh, you multiple why would I work on something that is not certain on the outcome? Because what business works like that? But that is about, there's an expectation that people have these unique sets of sort of candidates that come out of nowhere, and largely they don't. So I think that's the biggest common misconception. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just to add, there's one last thing I had, that it's all about the money. Um, and of course, you do it for fees. But I think that's, it's kind of everyone knows that people aren't motivated purely by money. And like you can do well in, in the recruitment industry or the headhunting industry. There's a lot of businesses that you can earn a lot more money in um, hedge funds, banking. And like most of the people I work with, yourself included, have got great degrees. I mean, you were a lawyer, right? You qualified as a lawyer. You, you probably earn more money being a corporate lawyer. We enjoy the job. <laughs> the best people, yeah, we probably should bring that up. The best people. <laughs> are doing it because they love doing the job and they love helping businesses along. And yes, they want to earn money out of it. But the idea that you're just doing it for a quick buck, I think is ludicrous. It's just, they're just there's easier ways to make a living. So but if you're going to be in this for 17 years, if you're just doing it for money, I, I, I think the idea that people would think that is, I understand it and I understand it because you see some of the behavior, but I think it's kind of, it's a really simplistic view because there's just simply it's a lot better ways to make money than there is the recruitment industry. It's just too hard. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally, uh, totally agree. From the candidate side and and the client side, just really interesting on on my side with them. Um, you know, particularly, I think there's so much. I think with your space and 
sales and go-to-market leaders within insurance it's so specific that they really have to lean on you heavily for that. But certainly in the world of tech, it is something more so in 2023 that I noticed where um, there can be six, seven, eight recruitment agencies all looking for the same people in the same area. So it does just beg the question, why not go with uh, one company and do your due diligence, as you rightfully said, you know, ask for references, ask for previous track records, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, you always, you mentioned something that, uh, or a phrase that I always love in terms of recruitment being the the bellwether of the, the economy is a bit of a wrap up on, on 2023. Like, what do you feel that that's for you signaled uh, for the whole of 2023? Like, what's your kind of main takeaways? Yeah, well, I'm pleased that you know when everyone's doing their out this year, in this year, in this year, out this year, yeah. out is just 2023. <laughs> like 2023, could just get in the bin. Um, it was just a tough year, and I think you know I consistently got asked how I thought the insure state of the insure tech industry was in and, and 2023. And I was bullish about it. Um, there were funds that were just not fully deployed. There were people talking about raising new funds. Well, if you're raising new funds, that money has to be deployed. So there is going to be investment in good ideas. Now, I have massive empathy for people that raised in, you know, 21, 22. Um, and the valuations got cast, cast adrift. But a lot of these businesses that were showing good progress got follow on rounds. So it was just a different investment environment. I, I think if we look at, you know, look at our performance, we were pretty flat. You know, we 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 did as well really as the year before. Um, and that's never sort of a bad thing. Um, but it's not great. And so I, I, I talked last year and I used the cricket analogy, which didn't really transact as we have mostly a uh, a US kind of following, but cricket analogy, I was hitting singles, net no fours and sixes. Baseball analogies, we were getting on base, but there were no home runs. And it was just hard. And I think there was a clearly an air of fear. There was an air of kind of um, trepidation. So what I found was that where there was a three-step process, it became a six-step process. And it became a six-step process on the fly. And it yeah. seemed like people were cautious and concerned about making decisions and hiring decisions. Um, roles got pulled. Um, people were aggressively going over the contract of, of, of like between external suppliers. So there was a much more kind of microscopic look at, and it just reflects the grow at all costs. We're sitting here, what are we, not even two weeks into the new year, and we're looking at like hyper exponential raising series b at 73 million you know uh, dollars we we're looking at companies like rainbow raising 12 million for you know restaurant specific uh mga and and then uh you know i know it's more complex than that but mm. these are quite big round sizes for businesses at, at the size i mean it's a very big round for hyphen exponential and that's an incredible business but but they're that's a bit of an outlier but the rounds have got bigger the investments are coming back we're hearing about people closing rounds, um, new rounds. Now, the size of those rounds are yet to be announced, which will be a bit more of a bellwether. But I would say that's the kind of like overarching macro view. On a kind of more micro level, what's getting investment? Much more traditional insurance play. So when we talk about what InsureTech is, we're seeing lots of digital MTAs. We're seeing digital agencies. Um, and I think that's a kind of natural conclusion in that the problem that we try to we try to outrun the valuation metrics of a traditional insurance business with companies like Lemonade. So we were sold or the public was sold them like a SaaS valuation. But it, you can't unrun, unrun a, outrun a loss ratio. So it's just a correction. So what I think we're seeing is just we're seeing more businesses that are almost traditional insurance businesses, but interesting in the being venture batch. Now, my question is, are they venture scalable? That's not for me to decide. The venture community is deciding that they are. Are they great businesses? 100%. Um, you know, you can, this, it's, it's less so in the UK, but in the US, this most insurance fortunes, I would say, 
on a kind of independent level have been made by broking and MGA businesses that have later been sold. So I think it's a great route to go down. And the other thing, finally, that I'll see is that there's just a continuation of much more discrete solutions being successful. And what I mean by that is that less of the kind of like broad, this is a SaaS platform for X part of the industry that covers everything and more this is an analytics tool that works specifically in property and those businesses are getting funded and being successful because they're tackling a known problem. It's quite discreet um, and they're doing it better than the competition. Those businesses seem to be performing well. But again, are they venture scalable? That's not a question I can answer, but those are the sort of trends that we're seeing. Those are the businesses that we're working with now, um, mm. which is always a reflection of how where the money's been spent. Mm. Yeah, I'm super interested to see um, what 2024 brings in terms of that niche focus within um, where people are going to innovate. Um, so yeah, 2023 is in the bin. Um, as a final yeah. question, uh, more related to 2024, and so you mentioned some positivity around Hyper Exponential and Rainbow and some positive noise at the beginning of the year. How do you feel scaling companies can set themselves up for hiring success in 2024 and maybe try and avoid the mistakes that were made in, in 2023? This question, and no one ever listens to me. Um, but I'll, 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 I'll give my I'll give my seventeen years uh, worth on this unload. Um, recruitment's about process, really. It's about people and process, but but it's about process more than anything. And, and as much as people don't like that, it's that's just true. You need to have rigor in what you're doing and everything that you're doing if you really want to scale. Talent and talent attraction is a core function of your business, whether you like it or not. You know, the classic mm -hmm. thing is, oh, how much do you spend on recruitment? Nothing. Oh, we source it all ourselves. Well, that's not nothing. That's your time. It's a bit like us saying podcasts are free. They're not free. You and I are sitting here for an hour. You know, we've had to buy equipment. Um, there's been planning that's gone into that. And that's just us. So, you know, the idea that it's free is just simply not true. So really, it's about who do you want to attract? And having a plan and a pipeline, because by the time you want to hire them, you should know who those people are. So I would say have a process in place for attracting talent. And that needs to be not just a kind of like ideology. It needs to be a kind of like practical methodology. So let's say that you want to address um, the representation of, of people of color in your business. What are you doing about that? Where's your outreach into that? What's your, where are you building communities of talent? Um, same could be said for addressing kind of gender imbalances. You know, go and find proactively. There's a lot of proactivity that has to be happen. Take a look at your employer brand. Are you representing the company and what you do? Great, but what what's it like to work at your business? Is there enough visibility of that? Are you on enough podcasts? Do you allow your people to kind of build their own brand on LinkedIn? Are you making kind of heroes of the people within your business by getting them on stages at conference like ITI or ITC? There's a lot there that you can do that drives attraction and then have a good process. You know, have a process for evaluating what salaries are out there. Speak to people like us, look at kind of what's out in the marketplace. You need to benchmark your salaries then you kind of need to kind of go, right, this is how we're going to do it ourselves. We need an internal process for that. And it needs to be set in stone. It can't be you start a three-stage process that becomes a six-stage process. If you can't find them yourselves, who are you going to work with? Build relationships with recruitment companies that you like and trust. Um, obviously, we're here for a business all day long, but it might not be us. You might, you might have people ask for ideas within your business. Do they feed back in? Interview those people ahead of time. Interview people like us. What have we done? What are we good for? Where can we help you? And then if you've got a timeline of when you need this person to start, work back from and get external advice. If you need this person to start in June, then you better be thinking about it now. So it's more having process and structure in place. And to be honest, it's taking external advice. You take external advice on almost everything. It's an arrogant, naive thing to think that you kind of know the best steps, even if you've done it before, because the talent market is continuously changing. What people want is continuously changing. What evolves is things like compensation, people's kind of like needs and wants. Um, and you need to be on top of that all the time. But 
the biggest thing is make it core. Like it's part of having a value structure. You, when business says, oh, these are our values, it's because it's close to the core of what they believe. Talent attraction needs to be part of the core of what you believe and, and, and a methodology attached to that. Otherwise, you've got no chance of scaling successfully. Well, um, that brings us to the end of the show, and uh, you know that was that was great, a lot of fun being the host on on here. But uh, <laughs> we covered a lot of grounds, um, and uh, yeah, it's been great. Thanks, Gavin. Uh, yeah, it's the most nervous I've been doing this show. So <laughs> thanks for being a great host on my podcast. <laughs> yeah. Anytime, anytime. Thanks, Bob.